In this video, I want to talk about building multi-tenant applications with .NET. I'll share a couple of best practices when it comes to designing your data model, filtering your data according to the current tenant, and how to extract the information of who is the current tenant for a particular request. So I'm actually making this video for two reasons. Reason number one being that I think this is valuable information that I should share with the public, even though a good chunk of it is probably common knowledge. And the second reason is making right about an earlier video I made about multi-tenancy, where a lot of you complain about some implementation details. So let's start from a blank slate and take a look at our domain. I have just two entities here, a user and their respective node. So we want to implement a multi-tenant application and we want to make sure that the data for each tenant is somehow separated from all the other tenants in the system. Now, a tenant could be just a single user or it could be some sort of company or organization and you want to make sure that you're isolating the data for all of your tenants. So in this example, I have an iTenant owned interface which defines a tenant ID property that we're going to implement with our domain entities. So both the node and the user belong to a given tenant. In this particular case, the user is also the tenant. If we want to have multiple users belonging to another tenant, then we could probably define the tenant as its own entity and have a relationship table connecting multiple users to a single tenant. So just including the tenant ID is only part of the story. Let me also show you the database context. And what I want to stress here is that you want to always index on the tenant ID column to speed up the respective queries. In a multi-tenant application, you will have a tenant ID filter in basically every query. So make sure you have an index for those queries to run faster. In the case of a user, the tenant ID is also going to be unique. So I'm enforcing this constraint with a unique index definition. In the case of the node, I just have a regular index on the tenant ID to speed up the queries. Now, this approach to building multi-tenant applications is a sort of logical separation in your database. You're using a column, the tenant ID, to denote which data belongs to which tenant. You could elevate this to a higher level of isolation by having a specific schema in your database for each tenant. This is a bit more complicated to implement, but it also works if you want to keep using a single database. Another thing you could do is have a data database per tenant, so we will still be using the same application database context, except for each tenant we would resolve a connection string from some secure store and instantiate the database context with the respective connection string. We could use a database context factory at runtime to make sure that the context is using the correct connection string. And another thing you can do when deploying multi-tenant applications is have each tenant run on a separate subdomain for the client application and that way you can make sure that all users that belong to a given tenant are going to only access the application from a single subdomain and use that to drive your backend. Now, where I'm going with this is our next topic, and that is how do we apply the tenant filter? In a previous video, I suggested using EF core query filters. So when configuring your entity, you can say has query filter. And in this example, I can configure a query filter on the user using the tenant ID, and I need to match this to some value. That also means I need to provide the tenant ID inside of the EF core database context. And I can only do this using a scope service because the context is scoped itself. And mind you, this will typically only work inside of an API request because we usually resolve the tenant ID at runtime from the current applications user. You can also use the same idea to apply multi-tenancy in a multi-database approach by resolving the connection string at runtime for the specific tenant. Now, in this video, I'm going to present a more balanced approach where we're going to use the user context to apply the filter. So the user context is an abstraction exposing a user ID that we're going to resolve from the claims coming from an access token. And then I'll have a method called getTenantID, which is going to fetch this value from the database. So let's go ahead and implement this method. In order for this to be performant, I'm going to create a cache key and cache the value for some short time period. And the cache key value will be user tenant. And I'm going to use the user ID property to fetch the current user. And I'm going to use hybrid cache to resolve this value. And I will have to type this out myself because the autocomplete is using a different suggestion. So we're calling get or create async and we want to return the tenant ID for the current user. So I'll pass in the cache key and then a function that's going to resolve this. Now, when it comes to the dependencies I have here, 
I'm using the application database context and the hybrid cache. The hybrid cache is just going to cache this value for a couple of minutes, let's say five minutes, and we actually want to query this at runtime from the database according to the user ID. This will come from the user ID claim present on the access token. So let's say I return a user. I'm going to say await db context users where the user ID is equal to the user ID for the current user. And then I can apply a projection. And for example, let's say I just return the tenant ID for the current user, and we can say first or default async. So if the user is null, then we can, for example, throw a new exception. I don't have a custom exception in place. So I'm going to say user not found otherwise we have the user and i want to return the respective tenant id let's make this async so it now compiles and i also want to pass in an instance of the hybrid cache entry options and here i'm going to define the expiration time so let's set the expiration to time span from minutes and for example five minutes so this is the implementation for fetching the tenant id in another video i did i was fetching this value from a request header this isn't really safe and that was the main pushback in that video even though i believe i mentioned that you're actually supposed to get this from an access token or resolve this value at runtime. Nonetheless, this is probably the correct way of doing it. So we are resolving the tenant ID from the database according to the currently authenticated user. And when you think about it, this really makes sense. You don't want to allow your clients to be able to specify the tenant ID. So then the next thing is, how do we apply the tenant filter? Well, I have a couple of endpoints here that are going to fetch the user's notes and also create a note. And you can see I'm already using the user context to get the tenant ID. So here I need to apply the tenant filter and I can say where the notes tenant ID is equal to the tenant ID value. And I would have to write this in all of the application queries where I want to apply the tenant filter. And this can be both cumbersome. And there's always the possibility that you forget to apply this. So I'll suggest one approach using extension methods on EF core. I'll create a new class called queryable extensions so let's make this static and i'm going to create a public static method returning a database set of t and let's call this for tenant and we specify the tenant id as the argument an important thing is having a generic constraint here that says that t and i have to make this a generic method is an implementation of i tenant owned now for this to be an extension method i have to specify what we are extending and i want to extend db set of t and let's call this the db set so then what do we do next so we can just say return db set where and because we are using the generic constraint we can access the tenant id property and apply the filter and i actually have to update this to return an i queryable so now i can go back to my application and here i can say for tenant and specify the tenant id and now this somewhat simplifies my implementation i have a simple extension method that's intuitive and i can apply it whenever I need to filter by the tenant. Moreover, I can now implement an analyzer to check my source code and anywhere where I'm querying an iTenant owned entity, I can make sure that this is followed by the respective call to for tenant. Now, what about when we are persisting changes to the database? So in this example, I'm creating a note and I'm specifying the tenant ID from the user context. I can also forget to do this. And if I don't have a database constraint, this could fail. So one thing you could do is for example in your database context you can override the save changes async method so let me go ahead and do that and while we are here we can do a full reach over all of the entries in the change tracker that implement i tenant owned and for example if the entity state is equal to added we can throw an exception if we didn't set the tenant id or you can also inject the user context inside of the database context. So let me demonstrate this. So I can inject I user context and back in save changes. Instead of throwing an exception, I can make sure that we always set the current value to user context get tenant ID. Now this is async, so I will have to await it. And then I need to make the entire method async and I also need to await the base call. So this is one approach. I, I will comment this out because I don't want to keep it. I'm going to manually set this in the endpoint. And just a quick demo of what this looks like when we start the application. I do have a helper function that's going to see the database with two users, assign them a fixed ID, which I'm going to to use in an access token 
and then some randomly generated tenant IDs. Let me start this and I'll jump over to the client application I prepared. So it's a simple UI application where you can specify a JSON web token and have it sent to the request to the backend. But first we need an access token. For this I'll use the CLI helper for creating user JWTs and I actually wanted to list out to see if I have any tokens here. So you can see I created one earlier and this can be really useful if you want to create some JSON web tokens to use for testing. Now if you don't have one you can create one by saying user JWTs create and you can specify any claims using this flag. So I'll specify the user ID in a claim and now I have a valid access token that I can use in my API requests. Back in the UI I can pass in the access token and let's try the who am I button. You can see we land on the breakpoint to resolve the tenant ID and now I'll access the database, fetch the tenant and now I have their tenant ID. So we're going to cache this, I'll press continue and in the UI we get a response with the user ID and the respective tenant ID. Then we can load the nodes for the current user. This is going to land in the respective endpoint, resolve the tenant ID this time from the cache and make sure to filter based on the current tenant when returning the nodes. So you can see we don't have any nodes so I can create one. So let's create a test node. This will land in another respective endpoint to resolve the tenant ID and then create a new node with the tenant ID applied. So I'll press continue. This sends automatically another request to fetch the notes. And if I keep pressing continue, we should see the note appear in the UI. Let's create another note for the same tenant. So I'll say create and let's actually get rid of all of the breakpoints. And I'll press continue and now we are seeing both nodes on the UI. If I go ahead and create another JSON web token for the other user that I have and I copy this value and we apply this in the JWT token field and I say load nodes, you can see that this time we don't get any nodes because this user doesn't have any nodes and this is how we can use the concept of a tenant to enforce data isolation in the application itself. If I go back to the endpoint for retrieving the nodes, notice that we aren't filtering based on the current user. User. We're always resolving just on the tenant and this makes sense because the user is the tenant in the context of this application. So let me know in the comments below this video what you think about the design decisions that I took here and I especially want to know what you would do differently. If you enjoyed this video then take a moment to smash the like button for the YouTube algorithm so it's recommended to more .NET developers and if you want to keep improving your .NET skills then go ahead and watch this video next. Thanks a lot for watching this video and until next time stay awesome.